Hey guys, how you doing? Who's all here right now? Who's checking in? Hey, Kelly, how are you doing today? Jace, hey, Amanda, how are you? Osahan, how are you doing today? Glad you could make it. What's up, Bavesh? Life treating you all right today? What's up, Nada? Hmm. Hey, Presley, how are you doing? A lot of homework? Well, I'm glad that teachers are finally uh, getting some stuff out to you guys. It's going to be, I think, the next, you know, few weeks are going to be interesting that way. So, I don't know exactly, you know, how it's all going to play out in the end, but uh, we're just kind of all in this together and we'll figure it out. I don't know, Bavesh, I don't have 200 subscribers yet. I'm at 198. I'm almost there. What do you think I should do to celebrate? Hey, Amal. How are you? <clears throat> Remember, tomorrow, guys, between uh, 10 and 11, I will be doing the uh, Zoom um, office hour thing. I'll send you the link later today um, where you can pop in and say hi and... Um, you know, ask any content-related questions or anything like that. Um, you know, we'll we'll see how that works, okay? We'll have a couple of opportunities this week to do that. Hey, Tyler, how are you? Just a couple more minutes here, and we'll get started. By my phone, it says it's 159. So uh, we'll get going here real soon. Vishnu, what's up, man? You doing all right? I am doing well. Okay, Kazi T, not real sure who that who that is, but yeah, thanks for using my first name. Appreciate that. Hey Yvette, how are you doing? Hey 
anyone know a good movie? Hey, Daniel, what's up? Glad you can make it. Sonic Top. Kelvin, really? Kazi T? Wow. Hey, Bob Bob, how are you? Why are you so tired of it? What have you been doing? You've had nothing but like three weeks off. How can you be tired? life life all right so let's get going um you know again i don't want to keep you uh, much more than you know 45 minutes as we typically go here um so i want to um you know use our time wisely hopefully all your other teachers have been in contact with you uh that is the expectation you know for us going forward is that every Sunday we are to upload what our schedule will be for the week. And I just want to make sure that, um, uh, <laughs> I just saw Daniel's arm is broken. He fell off his bike. Wow, Daniel. Um, that uh, teachers are supposed to give you, um, um, you know, things to do. And I can't say when or how it's going to be done yet, but just be prepared uh, in the upcoming days, especially, you know, next week. There will probably be some direction on grade taking. So that is coming forward. Be prepared for that. So make sure that uh, you're staying on top of everything. OK. Um, all right. So, again, if you have any questions on any sort of thing like that. Uh, make sure you pop into office hours this week, and uh, we'll see if we can discuss it. I'll tell you as much as I know. I'm, I don't have, I'm about this far ahead of you on any type of information that way coming from the district. So don't think I'm holding anything back. All right, so let's talk about, we're going to deal with the Silk Road today. Uh, we're going to deal with the Mongols, and we're also going to deal with uh, the Indian Ocean today. So we're going to take a look at networks of exchanges that is what Unit 2 is about. It's about all these areas that are interacting with each other and connecting with each other, all right? So our, you know, essential question for today, we're going to take a look at what were the causes and the effects of the growth of networks of exchange after 1200. And of course, you know, we've talked about this uh, network of exchange all year, uh, the Silk Road, you know, we can take a look at the Silk Road at began way back during the Han Dynasty. Um, so it connects all these areas of China together. It connects parts of South Asia, you know, India, and the Middle East, or what some people may call uh, West Asia uh, at this point, all right? So let's take, a, let's take a look at what helps cause this. Well, one of the first things that helps trade really begin to increase in this era of 1200 to 1400 or 1450, of course, are the Crusades. Now, the Crusades, of course, uh, if you can see my pointer there on the screen, you know, the Crusades are up here coming out of Europe and they head down to the Middle East here. So we start to see this connection between Western Europe and Asia. Now, this wouldn't be the first time that this has happened, but it's more intense than it was before because we get this demand for luxury goods. And when I say luxury goods, I'm talking silk, I'm talking spices, gold, ivory, things of that nature. So this demand for luxury goods 
just starts to increase over Eurasia, all right? Um, we have the rise of new empires facilitates this growth. And in our next unit here, later on, you know, in a few minutes, we're going to talk about one of those empires, the Mongol Empire, how they facilitated growth. You have the Tang and the Song dynasties coming out of China over here that facilitate the early growth of this. And then, of course, coming out of the Middle East here, you have uh, the Islamic Caliphates, the Abbasid Empire, really pushing trade into the Middle East. You know, things that are being offered. China is offering, you know, things like paper, the compass, gunpowder, porcelain, tea. All those things are considered luxury goods. Um, China imports things like cotton from the Middle East, precious stones, you know, dates, things that appeal to the upper class. Remember, your lower class people typically cannot afford this sort of thing. So a lot of this growth is due to upper class people wanting luxury goods. Uh, the Mongols, of course, had, you know, probably the most significant impact on this trade here because uh, they expand the Silk Road trade. Just take a look at this map here. I mean, it goes all the way from Hangzhou, Hangzhou, all the way over to Constantinople. That is the Silk Road. And of course, as we know, the Silk Road does include the Indian Ocean trade networks and some, some uh, routes over here in the South China Sea. All right, by the 14th century, uh, you know, we're talking the 1300s, that's what the 14th century is. Uh, we're talking that the Mongols have unified most of Asia at this point. Before then, it was broken up into China, into Russia, into South Asia, into India. You know, so the Mongols unify it and they create, you know, what is called the Pax Mongolica. And that is something we're going to talk about here in just a few minutes. We see this huge respect for merchants. Now, uh, they enforced laws. They made it safe to travel. So new trade channels were opening up across, you know, Afro-Eurasia at the time. Another cause for this expansion, of course, was technology. And this is something that we have talked about all year long, the growth of technology. And, you know, and when I talk technology, it's due transportation technologies. And you see the, you know, the image there to the left of a camel caravan. And you're thinking, what type of technology is this? You know, it's a saddle. It is the, it is the camel saddle. It allows for increased cargo to be carried. All right. And when you travel in hundreds of camels like that, that is quite a bit of, uh, of cargo being taken across this Saharan desert there, across the Trans-Saharan Trade Network. Uh, and then, of course, over here on the right, we see a Chinese junk, and they were some of the most technologically advanced ships of the time. Um, you have the magnetic compass, and you have new improved uh, rudder technology, you know, how a boat is steered on, uh, on these Chinese junks at this point. Okay, so those are all causes for the growth of uh, trade networks. Now let's take a look at what some of the effects are, because remember, one of your prompts might be a cause and effect. What causes networks of exchange to increase, okay? What are the causes of the effect and the effects of exchange networks during the time period of 1200 to 1450? And the things I'm talking about here today would greatly help you in that type of an essay, all right? So one of the effects were cities grow, okay? Uh, and oases grow because of this expansion of trade. And an oasis is this place in the middle of a desert where you have natural water, you know, springing up in the desert and trees are growing. And it's just a natural place where traders can rest in the middle of the desert. Now, there's not very many of them, but uh, there are a few. So you see the growth of that. That helps the expansion of trade. Uh, the city of Kashgar, right here in uh, China, uh, becomes this crossroad of trade between the northern and southern Silk Roads. You know, it leads to Pakistan, then to Central Asia, India, and Persia, or the Middle East there. Um, travelers and merchants depend on cities like Kashgar for food and water and resupplying. All right, Samarkand. This is Samarkand right here. It is in present-day Uzbekistan. All right, it was a center for cultural exchange between Christians and Buddhists and uh, Zoroastrianism and also Muslim. 
all right? They were all present in these cities. So as cities grow, culture begins to diffuse, and you see these cosmopolitan cities of, of education and cultural diffusion taking place along with, you know, trade, okay? Um, and again, what I have talked about before, along these trade routes, you have these inns and these, what they're called, caravansaries, all right? This is a caravansari. It is where camels could rest. They said a camel could travel about 100 miles a day without rest, without needing to be rewatered. And these caravansaries were established about 100 miles apart. And this is where camels could get resupplied. This is what, you know, a caravansari, a caravansari looks like in some, in some aspects. And the map over here shows you where they were located all across the Middle East there. Um, so these were very, very important for uh, travelers and merchants at this time. Another effect of the growth of exchange networks was new financial systems. Here is an image of, a, of paper money uh, that was developed in China. We now have a money economy. It wasn't barter anymore. It wasn't apples for oranges. It was apples for X amount of dollars, you know, if we speak about it in United States terms. So we have this money economy. And China develops what we call flying money or basically paper money. It's a lot easier to carry than heavy coins. Now, is the paper money worth anything? Absolutely not. Paper money is only worth as much as the paper that it's printed on. But you have to have a system that backs that up. So a, a merchant would take coins, put them in some sort of an institution, say, we'll just say 100 coins, all right? And then this institution would give them paper money in return that says, you have 100 coins in such and such institution, all right? So you take this money off into another place, and then you're able to use that money because everyone understands that this money is backed up with coins in another place. It's no different than a banking system that we have today. But up until this point, this was one of the first times we see something like this. Also, banking houses begin to grow in Europe. They're established in Europe. Uh, bills of exchange, which legally promise a set of amount paid by a certain date. This encourages trade. It makes it very, very easy. And one of the first European trade networks is the Hanseatic League, which you see here. All right, it was developed in Northern Europe in the 13th century. Again, that's the 1400s. It establishes a monopoly on trade with uh, timber, which is wood, uh, salted fish, leather, and grain. It helps protect against pirates, all right? Trade extends all the way to the Mediterranean where they came into contact with Arab caravans. And when they come into contact with Arab caravans, now all of a sudden they have goods coming out of North Africa, gold, salt, and ivory being introduced into this Hanseatic trade trade uh, network. So we start to see all this product coming across the world and people are gaining more and more interest in it here. All right, hang on, my PowerPoint just shut down on my phone. Here we go, let me get to the right one. All right, here we go. All right, and then this one here. Again, this is something that you might wanna take a screenshot of. I'm not gonna stay on it that long. Um, but it is basically innovations in commerce, things that happened from 500 BCE, a long time ago, up to about 1600. Coins, where did they come from? Where do we see them? When did they you know, originate? Uh, the Karabansari, uh, paper money, the, Hanselot, the Hanseatic League, banking house, bill of exchange. Where do we see these? This is a great uh, graphic here for you to really understand where things come from. And as you can see, most of it, China, 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 M Persian, the Middle East, Lydia or Lydia, 
and Turkey. Only one thing really comes out of Germany and or out of Europe, and that's out of Germany in the Hanseatic League. So please, you know, don't discount, you know, this slide. I think it's a it's a it's a very important slide that you know that we uh, that we can tend to understand. So that wraps up this portion of uh, the lecture on where these networks of exchange came from, the causes and effects. So when we, um, you know, start again here in a few minutes, we're going to be dealing with uh, the Mongols and their importance in this uh, modern world, all right? So I'm going to take a few moments for you to kind of, you know, grab something to drink, you know, rest your hand a little bit, and I'm going to take a look at, you know, uh, the questions here on the feed and see if there's anything I can answer. So if you have a question, please ask, and uh, we'll get started up here in the next couple of minutes. Okay. Uh, the Silk Road was an overturn. Um, Eric... Uh, with leather and grains was another thing that they had a monopoly on in the Hanseatic League. So timber, uh, salt, leather, and grains, or salted fish, I'm sorry, uh, were some of the things that they had a monopoly on. All right. questions being asked all right so you guys ready to go on to our next one here uh, Mongols. here we go okay here we go let's go ahead and get started on the Mongols and the question we're going to take a look at is uh, how did Eurasian empires grow over time and how did the expansion influence trade and communications? So when we take a look at this, uh, we are going to take a look, of course, at the Mongols for the most part, but we're also going to take a look at other portions of East Asia. As a, you know, when the Mongols go away, which they do, uh, we have other Chinese dynasties that come in that uh, we'll you know, briefly talk about as well. All right, so in world history, I'm going to have to say that the Mongols are probably, arguably, the most important historical thing to happen in trade in this, in this era. Um, you know, the Mongols are so important. You know, this group comes out of the middle of nowhere, and they rise to be this large empire, the largest land empire ever in the history of the planet. You know, so the Mongols basically affect everything here. All right, so let's give you a little bit of context here. You know, where did the Mongols come from? Uh, what are their surroundings? Okay, one of the one things that you have to remember in the 12th century, 1100s, I always, you know, continue to repeat that to make sure we understand, you know, our centuries and years here. Uh, the Mongols were just multiple clans of families and tribes. They were pastoral nomads. They herded goats for the most part across the Asian steppe there uh, near the Gobi Desert. Um, and being part of a Mongol clan, the expectation was that you had to be a skilled horse rider. And it didn't matter if you were men, a man or a woman. Everybody had to learn uh, that skill. Hunting and warfare was extremely valued, you know, in their culture. All right, so let's take a look at the first leader of the Mongol Empire. And, of course, he wasn't born Genghis Khan. That was not his name, all right? His name was Temujin, T-E-M-U-J-A-N. 
and he was born in 1162. Now, if you just refer to him as Genghis Khan, that's fine. You know, you're not going to be counted, you know, wrong on it. If, you know, if you refer to Genghis Khan as Genghis Khan before, you know, he takes on that leadership role. All right. And his goal was to build power. That's what Genghis Khan wanted. Uh, he formed key, uh, key friendships, was ruthless, was very ruthless, killed his own stepbrother uh, to take power, of course. Uh, he considered personal loyalty, loyalty to him, the best way to run his kingdom. All right. By 1206, he took on the name of Genghis Khan, which basically means ruler of all. So he has this very strong mentality that he is destined to rule this Mongol empire uh, that you see in front of you on this on your screen. Now, he begins his conquest, you know, shortly after becoming ruler of all um, in 1210. Um, and his reputation precedes him, man. He was a terrifying warrior. He would wipe out uh, the civilians of entire towns. It didn't matter, women and children. And of course, we hear the, you know, we hear the story that he raped so many women or his descendants, him and his descendants raped so many women in China that one in 2,000, or no, 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 it was one in 200 uh, that are people that are alive today have the DNA of Genghis Khan. So his, his brutality was infamous here. Uh, and stories of his brutality spread throughout the empire. Uh, people would give up. They would surrender before he even, before his troops even showed up in his cities. They just, they just gave up because they knew they were going to be slaughtered. So by giving up, uh, you know, probably saved thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of lives. Um, you know, by 1227, uh, Genghis uh, sets up the Khanate or kingdom which reaches from the North China Sea, which is, let me see, you know, right over in here is the North China Sea, all the way over to Persia, okay? And he was able to take over all of this land in a 17-year period, all right? The, the Romans didn't even have this much land in 400 years. Genghis Khan is able to do it in 17 all right. So that just goes to show you, you know, what his reputation is. People just give up before they before they even show. All right. And again, his empire, this huge empire that he creates over Asia would not have been possible if it hadn't been for the might of his army. OK, very efficient with the bow and the arrow or the compound bow, the short bow, as you see in the picture here, uh, the use of siege weapons. And remember, we saw the video of uh, Jenny Begg, you know, a Genghis Khan descendant, you know, throwing uh, the plague infested body of his, uh, bodies of his own soldiers into the city of Kafka on the Black Sea. And uh, they used siege weapons, just this constant bombardment of, uh, of uh, weapons. And then in the case of Kafka, of people here. Uh, efficient command structure. This is where modern militaries get their ideas, you know, of battalions and infantry and units and things like that. That comes from very early Mongol military strategy here. All right. Messengers. Their, their, their lines of communication were very, very good. Messengers on horseback allowed communication to travel faster. And again, if you remember the video we saw earlier this year, it was a very early version of the Pony Express. They would run their horses for 40 or 50 miles and there would be some sort of a, of a uh, rest station there. And then they would get on a brand new horse and take off again. So it was very, very efficient for the Mongols. So with all this in mind, the Mongols were able to set up this era, which we call the Pax Mongolica, all right? It is Mongols at peace, all right? Here you have religious tolerance here. Uh, trade explodes across Asia. Uh, it is said that Genghis Khan builds more bridges in their empire than any other ruler in history. And of course, that makes sense because if you take a look at how large this empire is, 
you need an infrastructure to run it. So bridges are very, very important. You see all the rivers and probably, you know, through the mountains where all these crevices and valleys have to be traversed somehow. So bridges are very, very important. And uh, the, the Mongols were very, very good at that. Okay, so the Mongol Empire continues to expand here, all right? Now, it becomes so big, it has to be divided into four khanates. And these four khanates are run by the, or run, are ran by the four grandsons of Genghis Khan. Uh, Batu, uh, his army is the Golden Horde, and they're located up here in Russia, in that part. Uh, the rulers, and they set up a tributary state in Russia. Remember, a tributary state is the state that needs to give you tribute, has to be a legion, has to pledge their obedience to whomever the ruler is, and they have to pay them in taxes or grain. And if you remember in the Aztec societies, tribute was sometimes in the form of prisoners uh, for sacrifice. All right? The rulers of the city-state of Moscow be begin to build you know, an anti-Mongol alliance here, because not everyone liked the Mongols here. All right, we'll talk about how the Mongols fell here in just a little bit. Who, uh, Hulagu was in the Islamic area, down in the Ilkhan Empire there. Um, and he converts to Islam. Again, remember, they are very religiously tolerant. Now, in all areas of the world, a really cool kind of story here about this area, about the Ilkhan Empire, is that they would go in and they would convert themselves to Muslim, all right? Now, the natives of this area never saw the Mongols as true followers of Islam. And some, you know, um, can't think of the guy's name right off the top of my head right now. It just, it just left me. But there was, a, there was a gentleman out there that said, you know, in the Quran, it says, Mongols cannot go to war, or not Mongols, Muslims cannot kill other Muslims. But in this case, uh, this one guy in the Mongol Empire there in the Middle East said that Mongols are not true Muslims. So you can kill them in rebellion. Women and children are allowed to be killed if they are not true Muslims. And, you know, we fast forward to, you know, the 21st century. Uh, you have a guy by the name of Osama bin Laden who follows the same rhetoric as the guy who fought against the Mongols. And you get, you know, the Twin Towers. So, um, you know, 9-11 is kind of connected to the Mongols because of the guy who fought against the Mongols in this area of the world. All right. Um, you have Kublai Khan. He is located in China here, all right? Uh, he establishes what is called the Yuan Dynasty. It promotes religious tolerance there as well. He brings prosperity to China during this time. Uh, lots of cultural exchanges, improved trade with other countries. Now, Mongol women had a lot more independent lives than other women across uh, the world. Uh, they were able to ride horses uh, they were able to wear leather pants. I don't know if that is such a huge thing for women, but no else, nowhere else in the world do we see that, all right? They could be remarried after being widowed, and they could initiate divorce in some cases if they needed to. So Mongol women were treated with a lot more respect than where we see in other areas of the world at the time, all right? So again... Uh, the Mongol Empire, you know, truly expands, but a not everyone is happy with it, and a lot of people begin to fight back, uh, especially in China. They begin to alienate many Chinese because they are foreigners, all right? They are not native to China, and uh, they hire foreigners to run the government, uh, not native-born Chinese. So a lot of people in China are uh, upset about this. Also, another thing is that the Mongols promote Buddhism while they're in China. And that upsets the scholar gentry who are Confucianists, all right? They do not use the civil service exam. By the 1350s, this group called the White Lotus Society begin to organize to put an end to Mongol rule, all right? 
So by 1368, the Mongol dynasty falls in China and the Ming dynasty, that is this right hand uh, visual here, is founded. You know, other areas such as Russia, uh, they begin to push out the Mongols as well. So the Mongols hold on power lasts for about 120, 150 years or so. It's not a very long time period, but what they did is very, very important. So we're gonna take a look at some of these long-term impacts of Mongolian uh, invasions. All right. Uh, one of the effects, the largest land empire ever. You know, we saw that. During the Pax Mongolica, we see this increase in interregional trade, trade from China to South Asia, to the Middle East, all the way to Europe, into Russia. We see this cross-cultural exchange. Uh, Islamic scientific knowledge made its way into China. Paper-making techniques are able to make their way into Europe. And of course, uh, centralized power, one law for all conquered areas, that's pretty huge. Mongol fighting techniques and Western Europe's use of knights in armor because those knights in armor couldn't couldn't move when it came to uh, fighting against the Mongols. Uh, the era of the walled city came to an end. We see this less and less after the Mongols because due to siege warfare, things that can be tossed over across a wall or even uh, gunpowder technology like the cannon is introduced. And so walled cities become very, very obsolete. And then of course, one of the things that's a huge impact of the Mongolian invasions is uh, the Black Plague as it spreads all across Asia here. Uh, <clears throat> and as you can see, uh, these are the dates of when the Black Plague hits certain areas. So it's really ramping high here in the early 1300s and then you know, by the middle of the 14th century, we see it hitting Europe there. So it takes about 20 years to get all the way across. And remember, the Black Plague kills um, about a third to a half of Europe's population at this time. Okay, so that is a huge long-term effect of, uh, of uh, the Mongol Empire. All right, so that ends up with the Mongol Empire. And again, I'm going to give you a couple of minutes to kind of re-energize. And we are going to talk about our last uh, topic of the day, which is exchange in the Indian Ocean. And I'll take a look at questions here if you have any. Uh, let me see. Uh, Aman, probably not. Uh, using his real name would not be considered outside evidence. It needs to be a little bit more uh, in depth and historical, you know, a, a historical fact other than that. All right. I doubt it all depends on the question, too. Uh, but using his real name, Temujin, is not something that uh, will get you an outside evidence point. It was your right hand. Did it, Daniel? Did your right hand get? Bro is it broken? Let me ask you that. <laughs> Tell a joke. <laughs> I don't know any good jokes. Ah, good. It's not broke, just bruised.
Well, good thing, uh, Daniel, this isn't a writing test anymore. You'll be able to type it, you know, on a computer. So I guess we don't have to worry about writing anymore. That way, anyway, you're handwritten, I should say. You still have to worry about writing, but it's all going to be on a computer. Nope, no, Nicholas, no dad jokes. I don't have any. I'm sorry. Okay, let's get rolling so I can let you get back to your day. Uh, you probably got other things that you need to take care of uh, with other classes. Um, again, um, make sure that uh, uh, you're staying on top of everything that you need to work on. And, you know, I'm not going to, I, I can't give you any details because I don't know them, but just be ready for, you know, things starting to be graded somehow uh, with your teachers because, you know, we're out till the 17th, which is pff, almost another three weeks. You know, we got three full weeks till the 17th. And then after that, I don't know. I don't, I'm not even going to try and guess to when, uh, you know, we'll see each other again you know, live and in person. All right. So let's, uh, let's do, let's do this one. So we have the exchange in the Indian ocean. And again, very important trade networks here. All right. That's what this unit is about. It is networks of exchange. And we've already done the Silk Road, that land-based empire, what the Mongols did for that. And now we have the Indian ocean trade network. And we're going to take a look at what were the causes and the effects of the growth of networks of exchange after 1200, and how did the environmental knowledge support that expansion? Because you have to know something about uh, the weather and the climate and uh, the environment to make exchange happen really, really well in uh, the Indian Ocean, of course. And again, luxury items are traded. Those are the big things. You know, you have things like lumber, uh, textiles, coffee, spices. Those things are being exchanged now in the Indian Ocean. And, of course, you have uh, silk as well. All right, so let's take a look at the causes of why trade expanded in the Indian Ocean. All right, so South Asia, this is, where's my mouse here? There it is. South Asia, which is India, benefits in trade due to its location in the Indian Ocean Basin. Just take a look at it where it is located, all right? You get trade from the Middle East and East Africa. You get trade from China and Southeast Asia. So you have all sorts of trade hitting it on both coasts of South Asia here. All right, and this has been going on since around 200 BCE. And the spread of Islam, as Islam spreads across, you know, uh, Arabia and Persia and down the east coast of Africa there, it just increases this trade. It uh, connects very, very important uh, trade cities. You have Kilwa and Zanabar down here, and then you have Calicut uh, over here in India, and that becomes a very, very important trade center due to its interaction to the Middle East or West Asia and East Africa there. Uh, local rulers welcomed Chinese and Muslim merchants uh, because they brought the city incredible wealth. So it was a very welcoming area of the world as well. Um, you have this increased demand for specialized goods here. India became known for its cotton fabrics, uh, woven carpets, pepper, Malaysia, down here in uh, Southeast Asia, is known for, uh, they're known as the Spice Islands. Uh, nutmeg and cinnamon and cloves. You know, those things that you go into your, into your pantry at home, you will find these sorts of things, pepper and nutmeg and cinnamon and cloves. At this time, they were considered very luxurious uh, trade items, very, very expensive. You know, today we can go to Walmart if it's not all blown out due to, due to this apocalypse that we're currently having, uh, you can get it for cheap. Um, the Swahili trading area there on the east coast of Africa, uh, I don't have a picture of that here, uh, but that would have been over here in this area. 
Uh, you have slaves, gold and ivory. China has silk and porcelain and tea. Uh, Southwest Asia, the Middle East here, uh, they have horses and figs and dates and, and coffee as well. So we see huge amounts of trade products taking place here. And why I said, you know, in the essential question, it said, you know, you needed environmental knowledge here to be a decent trader and, a, and become wealthy. Uh, the monsoon winds here in um, the Indian Ocean, all right, they changed from November to February. The monsoon winds ran in a southwestern direction, and then from April to September, they ran, you know, in a northeast uh, fashion here. So if you didn't understand these favorable winds, you could be stuck in a port for months at a time not being able to move. And your shipping technology needed to be just right so you could adjust to those winds. And that is what the Latin sail helped with on the, uh, on the Islamic uh, Dow ships. They had these Latin sails, which is um, a triangular type of sail. All right. You had uh, very good rudder technology from Chinese ships. And you had, of course, the Astrolab, which where you could navigate by uh, the stars and the sun in, uh, in this area of the world. All right. Uh, growth of states like uh, Malacca right here. All right. These are what is called the Malacca Straits. All right. And this area of the world, especially Malacca, became very, very wealthy because any ship that would pass through this area going north or south, um, Malacca would impose a fee on it. Uh, it'll cost you $100 to go through here. And if you got it, great, go ahead, enjoy trading with someone else. If you don't have it, this is where you stop. All right, so Malacca becomes very, very wealthy here. Um, you know, Malacca's wealth was based on trade alone. You know, a lot of a lot of cities their, and countries, their, their uh, wealth is not based on just trade. It's based on agriculture or manufacturing or mining. You know, Malacca has none of that. It is solely based on trade, all right, by imposing those fees, people coming in and spending money, you know, in and out of the city. Uh, the Portuguese take it over in the year about 1511, uh, and they become somewhat wealthy at it or because of it for a very short time. But, uh, you know, eventually they lose all their power in there. Uh, today, uh, this is what this picture is, about 60,000 ships pass through the Malacca Straits uh, every year. So this area of the world is still a very, very important trading area. Uh, okay, so the one thing that we have to keep in mind is as people traded, they leave their homes. They leave their homes in East Africa and they settled down in South India uh, or South Asia, all right? Uh, this is called diaspora, all right? Diaspora, all right? This is the movement of people. You have a group of people that have left their homeland and now they live elsewhere, all right? But they still, you know, have a large population in their homeland. So the merchant community of Muslims, they move to places like China, the Indian Ocean Basin in Europe. Uh, the Chinese go to Southeast Asia, Africa. Uh, you know, the Jewish people, the Hebrews, they go to China, India, and Europe. Uh, the Malays, they move to Sri Lanka. And again, it's all based on trade. So you see these diasporic communities um, beginning to form in various areas of the world here. All right, my phone shut down. All right going on. So this cultural interaction, you know, works both ways. All right. So some effects of these expanded uh, exchange in the Indian Ocean. One of the responses to increased trade, governments become very, very involved with trade to increase its efficiency. Um, and it's also a way for governments to raise money. Um, 
put taxes on imported goods. Okay, uh, the kingdom of Gurjat in Western India raised so much money with customs uh, that they were wealthier than a lot of European states at the time. All right, um, the Swahili city states and the trading cities like Kilwa in this area here. Um, they become very, very wealthy due to this trade. Um, things that were traded, gold, ivory, slaves, uh, along with tortoiseshells, peacock feathers, and rhinoceros horns. So things you typically wouldn't think would be traded, but they are, all right? So tremendous wealth is gained in a lot of these areas here, okay? And we get a lot of transfer of knowledge, we get a lot of transfer of culture, technology, commerce, religion begins to spread. Um, and one of the last things I want to talk about here is this gentleman here, Zheng Ha or Zheng He. Now, when you translate that into Arabic, uh, it means Muhammad. Zheng He was a Muslim trader, all right? Um, and China at this time, at the very beginning of the Ming Dynasty, wanted to show off their wealth. They wanted to show off their power because they were coming out of, of, of you know, several years under Mongol rule. So in 1405, he begins the first of his voyages. Now he takes several voyages over the course of 30 years. Uh, and at the height of his voyages, he had over 300 ships, uh, 28 thousand sailors. Now, this wasn't, these weren't trading ships. Did they trade when they go out? Yes, but that was not what their primary goal was here. Their primary goal was to show off. That's what it was. It was to show the power and the prestige for China. For China. That's what they wanted. Um, you know, Zheng He usually attained his goals through diplomacy. He was a very good diplomat that way. Um, his large, he had a large army, uh, and that suppressed many Chinese enemies. Um, and he didn't have a problem with ruthlessly destroying some of these enemies. Um, you know, he destroyed several pirates that had long plagued uh, Chinese and Southeast Asian waters at this time. All right. There was a guy by the name of Chen Zui. He was one of the most feared pirates in this area to ever, you know, infest uh, Southeast Asia. Uh Zheng Ha was able to defeat uh, Zhu Yi's fleet, killing 5,000 of his men along the way. Uh, and then, of course, he captures Zhu Yi and he brings him to China where he was publicly executed. All right. And again, this shows off the power and the might of China at this time. Now, these voyages take place over 30 years. All right. So we see a lot of <clears throat> international cultural diffusion taking place from outside of China, all right? So many Confucianists in China at the time are very, very worried about this because remember, Confucianists like China for China. They don't like outside influences. It's very similar, you know, to today. They don't like a lot of influence from the Western world. Uh, so a lot of these Confucianists in the government saw these voyages as way too expensive. And then, of course, the exposure to foreign countries threatens China's social order. All right. So eventually what's going to happen here is that they stop the voyages of uh, Zheng He. They burn the boats. They destroy the records because they don't want people to know what was out there, especially the Chinese people. Uh, the emperor at the time also made it illegal to build a ship with two masts to discourage this long distance trade that, uh, you know, Zheng He was known for. All right, so the things to get out of this, uh, you know, the effects of, of the Indian Ocean trade was that it increases cultural contact, it increases diffusion across the world, religion spread, large groups of people move from one area of the world. You know, in India, we will see, you know, Muslim communities, uh, Muslim merchants marry local women, and they will convert to Islam. So we just see this huge 
interconnected world for the first time, especially in Asia. Um, and after this time period, when we get through Unit 2, we'll be heading into, you know, Unit 3 and Unit 4, which deals with places like, you know, Christopher Columbus and the connection of the Western Hemisphere to the Eastern Hemisphere. All right, so that wraps up uh, the lecture for today. Um, again, one thing you need to be doing, guys, is I have opened up the Unit 1 multiple choice questions and an FRQ in uh, the AP classroom. Remember, the AP classroom is what you registered for at the beginning of the year. You have to go to the uh, AP College Board website uh, to get in there. I don't have control of any passwords or anything of that nature. If you can't find your password, you can't log in, you have to contact College Board. I cannot do anything about that. Please answer those questions. Everyone needs to do that. All right. There's also an FRQ in there. I will just ask you to try and answer it in 35 minutes. And again, I've downloaded, you have to download what is called the lockdown browser onto your computer or whatever platform you're going to use to take the AP exam. Uh, College Board requires that. So please uh, take care of that as well. I know some of you are having problems with it. Um, I can't do anything from my end to help you through it except maybe tell you to call College Board. I downloaded that lockdown browser onto my computer and it seems to work fine. Uh, so those types of things we're going to have to figure out along the way. We have, you know, a few weeks yet here before the AP exam, so hopefully a lot of this stuff will get answered and taken care of beforehand. So I don't have anything else. All I ask you guys is to uh, come into, uh, you know, office hours between 10 and 11 tomorrow. And if you have any specific questions or just pop in to say hi, I would, you know, totally, totally appreciate that. I would love to see uh, your smiling face. So you guys take care, uh, stay sane, and be safe, all right?